today and to those that are joining us remotely, thank you for being on with us. Um, we've got quite a number of things we're going to try to cover today. We'll get through some of them pretty quickly. Some of them are a little more interesting and we'll spend a little more time with those. Um, let's see, what do we have here on the agenda to start with? Um, All right. Well, uh, Gerald, I'm going to going to hand off to you and ask you to provide us a little bit of information relative to your to the education pathway and what you've got cooking over in, in Stanley County. Thank you. Can uh, everybody hear me? Yes. 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 OK, great. Um, I wish I could have been there in person. I had uh, hoped that I could. Uh, however, when we rescheduled the meeting, I had a family vacation plan, and so that made it impossible for me to get there. Um, as you know, our committee has been working on an apprenticeship program for fiber optic technicians, and uh, we've come a long way. It's been an arduous process, taking a lot longer than I would have expected, but we are making progress. We're at the point right now where uh, the curriculum has been put together. Uh, some teachers have been selected. Uh, the college has signed off on it and made a funding request to the Golden Leaf Foundation. Um, we had originally hoped that we could get <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> some funding from the Lead, uh, workforce development grants, but uh, the timing was different. It's going to be another six months or a year before I think any of that money is going to be available. So we had to turn and uh, find another source. And of course, that's been Golden Leaf. I'm working with uh, Mr. Charles Brown of the Golden Leaf Foundation. He's the chair of rural infrastructure uh, and uh, uh, they award grants uh, to support economic development in rural communities and he is very focused on broadband connectivity. Uh, we're just at the point now that we've already submitted our request and Golden Leaf uh, has come back and asked us for letters of recommendation from industry leaders. And uh, we we are doing that. And uh, Secretary Weaver has even graciously offered to write a, le a letter on our behalf. So if uh, there's any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. But it's uh, slow but steady. <clears throat> are there any questions? Yeah, Gerald, I think we have the um, draft of the letter. It's just, it's getting to me not a review, so, but that is underway as you noted. Gerald, I do have one question. So once you've submitted these letters, what's sort of the next step and where do you, what's your, what do you think your timeline is at this point? Well, our goal is to actually have the first class seated uh, prior to the uh, great grants being awarded or the money being awarded and the uh, B grants, uh, we uh, need to get prepared. There, we've already laid out that there's a great demand for it. All this money hitting the street at one time is going to create a lot of demand. And <clears throat> um, as you have explained to me, 20% of the expense is in uh, the materials, but 80% is in labor, and we're woefully short on. Uh, people to do the work. Uh, the industry, uh, industry people are saying that we're going to need another 850,000 uh, workers to do all the work that's going to need to be done, not just in North Carolina, but across the United States. Um, the, and one of the things that has exacerbated the, the need is, of course, the devastation that was up in Western North Carolina. It ruined a lot of infrastructure. And then on top of all these other projects now, that's got to be repaired as well. So uh, the hope is that within six months, we'll be able to have a seated class. That's the goal. Interesting. Okay. 
Can I ask a question too? Sure. Um, is the expectation then from what you described that these would, oh, sorry, Tracy, if you think from, from Duke, um, is the expectation that the graduates of this program would then um, work in the field to do the repairs out in the broad area of, right, the interconnectivity at the middle mile, last mile, or is the expectation that they would be the people who would be working inside buildings doing all of the fiber connections and all of the work there? Actually, the project uh, is we are going to take it from shovel to actually application. Thank uh, you. So, yes, uh, a lot of the equipment, uh, the horizontal drilling equipment, that's part of it, using the heavy other equipment, you know, backhoes, et cetera, uh, teaching every aspect of it. But uh, uh, certainly filling in the areas right now where there is a demand. Gerald, admirable. I appreciate you taking the initiative to put this together. Um, I know we've been talking about it and working on it for more than a year at this point. Um, I, and I'm happy to see that it looks like it's coming to fruition for you. Yes, sir. <laughs> and it's certainly going to come at a time when it's needed. And uh, I can imagine as fast as those graduates come out, they'll find a, they'll find a home. They'll find a place to go to work. Certainly. Anybody have any additional questions for Gerald related? Gerald, thanks for that. Thanks for that recap. Keep us posted on developments. Anything we can do to help? I know Jeff asked if he wanted people to introduce just because there's yeah, a few people. Okay, we can do that. So a few people that are sitting in for the fourth members. For some folks, yeah. We're remiss in not having done that to start with, but. Um, why don't you start who you are and where you come from? Why are you here? That's a good question. I don't know if I can answer the last one. Uh, Jeff Tart, and I live in Mecklenburg County over on Lake Norman, Cornelius. Three Givens, Chief Privacy Officer, DIT. Sarah Porper, um, Director of Strategy and staff to the IT Strategy Board. Important to note, maybe we should also say if we're board members. Oh, right, and I'm on the board. Not on the board. Not on. Len Poplowski, head up strategy and governance at DIT, not on the board. Hey, Mr. Chair, Mike Arnold, I'm, I had a pleasure sitting in for State Budget Director Kristen Walker today. As you know, she's um, very heavily engaged in doing the damage needs assessment for Western North Carolina right now. So first, she sends her apologies. Uh, Keith Briggs on the board, and uh, I also am responsible for architecture and innovation for DIT. And Jim Weaver on the board, DIT. Lee Brenman with Fountain Works, and we support the board. James Tanzos, DIT statewide IT procurement, not on the board. Tracy Fusey um, from Duke University and a member of the board. Folks, well, remote, if you can identify yourselves for us, I appreciate it. And I think just board members for the remote people. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi there, I'm Joe Abernathy. I am on the board. I was until recently with Blue Cross of North Carolina and next week um, I'm actually starting with a different Blue Cross plan, Care First, which covers members in Maryland, D.C. and all federal employees. Wow. Does that mean a relocation or can you stay here? Nope, it's remote with occasional okay. travel to Baltimore, so not bad. Congrats. Well, congratulations on that, Jim. Thank you. Gerald Poplin, uh, board member. I think Keith and Patrick are both online. Sure. Keith Warner, CIO at uh, Appalachian State, um, board member uh, by delegation from President Hans. Yep, Patrick Fleming, North Carolina Community College System Office, delegate for President Jeff Cox. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And I'm Rocco DeSanto, board chair on the board, uh, board chair through the end of the year, and then we'll be handing, handing the mantle off to someone else. 
Um, having had Gerald's education pathway update, I think we're going to do, uh, Jim, if you can give us a DIT update. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it'll tie into another topic uh, hopefully we'll talk about as a board as well. So um, just to begin with, the last time we were together, we talked about the concept of an AI day um, that the state was going to host. Um, we are now looking at an AI privacy cyber forum that will be occurring over the course of December 4th and 5th. Uh, that will be done at the Raleigh Convention Center. Um, it will be getting sponsored by eRepublic. Um, so more communication will be forthcoming. Um, really targeting state and local government. Um, as we talk about AI, it'll be less focused on tech stuff and probably more on the business side if, if we can get a successful outreach to that type of, um, of the community. Um, I think we have a, a good agenda. Um, I don't believe we did the Jeff answer of going out and asking ChatGPT what an agenda should look like, but <laughs> instead we asked that Keith Briggs know. Uh, <laughs> And I use ChatGPT. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a draft agenda. Uh, we did review that with the governor's office here earlier this week. So we got some tweaks to do with it, but I think it's going to be pretty good um, overall. Looking at you know again, um, we are public sector, so a risk-based approach is still very prudent. With that and said, however, we also want to look at innovation. Uh, see what's going on across uh, the different sectors of public or across the different areas of public sector. Um, also trying to do something along the lines of some uh, some type of prompting education. So like one of the things, um, spend a uh, eight hours, uh, NGA had hosted a um, an AI uh, session for um, governor's offices. And um, the takeaway I had from that was we spent an hour and a half doing prompting. Um, and it was, you know, um, it, and I will admit it was probably the best part of the entire eight hours of focus. Um, because it really demonstrated how you ask and formulate a question matters as far as what results you get. And uh, I think it was interesting um, the, the scenario, there was a Harvard professor that walked us through this, but something that's near and dear to him and as well as Keith from living in Boston, what's the name of this, the Avenue Sturro? Sturro Drive. Sturro Drive, right. So Sturro Drive is infamous for its low um, overpasses which historically has a tremendous number of vehicles to get stuck under during the first weekend of September when everybody's going back to Harvard and MIT and trying to move back into the area. Um, known for tremendous traffic jams, and of course it's long, it goes along the one side of the Charles River. So it was a whole concept around that, like understanding what thoroughing is, as the, as the term is called, um, understanding uh, what, gener what creates the problem and then what are creative ways to come up to resolve stirring um, all in all. And it was really amazing how I my thought process was. And then I had a colleague from Maryland uh, that was at our table who is a um, an AI person. And he started in with creating a whole persona before he even asked his first question. And it's just like, I went right to asking questions. He created, I'm a DOT engineer for the city of Boston. I am studying, blah, 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 blah. Just a totally different thought process. Um, and you you picked your tool. I used ChatGPT. I had some colleagues that used uh, Gemini. Um, interestingly enough, we all got to the same outcomes at the end. Uh, but there were times where um, there were incorrect answers being provided by the tool. Um, and the tool caught itself on incorrect answers. Um, as well, but it was just interesting how important it was, how you phrase the questions, um, the fact that he purposely misspelled words, the tool figured out what he was trying to say. He could interrupt verbally talking to him and saying, no, I want you, no, I want you to do. Um, and so uh, it was just interesting. And so that's one of the things we're looking at is how do we do something maybe along those lines as an education opportunity of why prompting matters. Um, and it's not programmers that need to do prompting. It's all of us if we're going to leverage these tools effectively. So more to come on that. Um, Jim, I have one question yeah. related to what you're just talking about. It might be more technical than we need to get into, but I'm curious. You said it corrected itself. <clears throat> you had to know that it was wrong and ask it another prompt to do that. It didn't just. No, it didn't. It didn't. Exactly. Right. Okay. And, and really what it did was it, it had indicated there was some level of integration with Waze and Google Maps, um, which it wasn't. 
Right. Um, yeah. And then later, in another response, it had come back and gave a, the so correct answer. But it was, yeah, right. it was interesting. So yeah, and he purposely was showing us because he knew that was what the response was going to be. So again, it just shows how you asked the question. Um, you know, as we talked about Western North Carolina, Helene recovery efforts, um, you know, we've been very fortunate to have a very robust, resilient next gen 911 system. Um, I know Pokey and, and the team next door is extremely proud of, of how the system did work, but I think at high point we had 19 PSAPs that were down or in some type of diminished capacity. Um, and those calls were getting rerouted and picked up by colleagues and counterparts in central North Carolina, eastern North Carolina, um, being dispatched back over radio. Uh, just a tremendous story there to tell. Um, but we're now at a point where we have every PSAP backup operational and, and um, answering their own calls. And as you can imagine, if you were in a devastated county, you wanted to be there helping. Um, and so we had a lot of urgency. I don't know if you want to give like a 30 second Pokey, if everybody doesn't know, Pokey Harris, our executive director for 911. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our house. Uh, coffee and water in the kitchen. Please help yourself. Yes, we are. We don't want to use the word celebrating right now because um, that's not the appropriate word for what's happened. But we're acknowledging the success of the investment of the North Carolina 911 board in its next generation 911 um, efforts with our statewide EasyNet or our emergency services internet protocol network. As Jim said, there were 19 911 centers in the western part of the state that were impacted. Uh, that means that they couldn't receive 911 calls and they couldn't receive 911 calls because the last mile carrier, the commercial carrier, could not transmit or transition, uh, transfer that call to them from the caller. If the caller could reach their carrier, with the 911 call, it did traverse <clears throat> our EasyNet, and those 19 911 centers were sending their calls to 23 other 911 centers across the state. Uh, they were uh, different uh, types of routing, uh, alternate routing. If the one PSAP was so busy that their calls would overflow, another PSAP or 911 center was taking their calls. If a 911 center was uh, in a state of abandonment, which means they could not take their calls at all, there was no no attempt for that 911 call to terminate at the um, what would be the um, original 911 center. Uh, for several days, we remained in that status of 19 to 23, and then it began gradually began to decrease as the carriers were able to restore their infrastructure. Last Friday, we marked another first or milestone for the uh, the North Carolina NG 911 effort in that the last 911 center, Madison County, uh, they're being impacted by Frontier's um, infrastructure that is totally destroyed in Marshall, North Carolina. Uh, we were able to um, uh, fast track, if you will, our tertiary planning for the use of FirstNet. Uh, as a, <clears throat> not the first net that some of you all are familiar with, but very closed private network of first net uh, in parallel to our AZ net <clears throat> for the 911 calls to reach the Madison County 911 Center. Also, we we're able to put a um, SAT Colt or a satellite uh, unit, a huge truck with a satellite device on it there for redundancy as well. We've been told that it's going to be some time before the infrastructure in Marshall is put back to normal. So they will continue to operate. So since Friday, they will be as stable as our EasyNet. We're very proud to say that the EasyNet and all of our specialized call handling equipment was completely stable for the entire month that um, we had to move calls around. There was no single incident of a call dropped. There were no blinks, blips. You can't or whatever, yeah. None whatsoever. So the investment of the North Carolina 911 board has paid off. Kudos to all the PSAP managers, all the telecommunicators across the state that were played an instrumental role in all of this. And I would offer, if you are here as a board member and never seen um, our end maps next door here, I'm sure folks would be more than happy to take you over and kind of give you a quick statewide view. So I do have a quick question, too. When, they, when one of your sites goes down, is there just an automatic failover or does someone here have to redirect how that's going to work? Very good question. It's automatic and immediate, uh, whether it's alternate routing uh, in that uh, uh, the system recognizes that um, there is a, a volume, overflow volume or what have you, 
and by policy routing across the IP network, it will go ahead and do that. Uh, the abandonment routing is already built and in place, and if that PSAP cannot take it, so yes, it's automatic and immediate. Unlike the old days, when we had copper wire, we had to engage the the, the telecom provider and, and do switches at the CO and things like that. So it's all IP network, yes, sir. We, we jokingly implemented what we what is it called? Four, find four friends? Yes, find yeah, four fi friends. Find four friends, but basically four four other PSAPs that are already pre-set up that your calls will route to automatically. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's not necessarily a reciprocal relationship, but there's um, different things involved there. Um, the other thing, just to note, <clears throat> you know, Pokey talked about uh, first net wireless. So if you think about it, we had diverse carrier coming in the PSAP to a diverse entry, and we had a tertiary of first net wireless, and the devastation out there, all three of those were wiped out. Uh, so now uh, we are taking a look at um, satellite as a fourth option in the event of, and of course, if the Cat 4, Cat 5 storm sitting over North Carolina, satellite's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to function, but it'll be there for recovery efforts mm -hmm. immediately after. Um, so we're going to take a look at that and see what we might be able to do there differently or what options we can for continuity of operations in that regard. Jim, okay. yeah. FirstNet is completely AT&T? Yes. Yes, it is. But the, but the FirstNet that we are utilizing utilizing and we're contracted with them. We like to say it's not your grandma's FirstNet because sure. you know, a lot of jurisdictions are utilizing FirstNet for for their comms, uh, this is a, a parallel network to the to the AZNet, but it is provided for, for by responders them. primarily. This this is only for our 911 centers. It's not the same network. It's not the for same the first as responders. Right. Parallel to that. So, in conjunction with that, I'm I'm curious if Patrick or Keith can give us a little insight into what the university or the community college systems did in light of this. Did you have a similar failover architecture in place that um, the 911 folks have, or how, were you able to operate, or how are you operating at this point? Well, uh, from the community college perspective, all of the colleges are back online, but like uh, the majority of Western NC, uh, the infrastructure is significantly damaged. Colleges do have multiple ISPs coming into their campus with the primary ISP being MCNC. It didn't particularly matter for the 14 colleges that were in, uh, community colleges that were impacted in Western North Carolina. Uh, MCNC responded quickly and internet uh, services were restored within roughly five days for the 14 impacted colleges. We did manage to procure uh, a handful of the Starlink kits for those colleges and get them out. And the, I tell you, the satellite technology was a game changer for basic connectivity uh, for those impacted by the storm. So the short answer was the depth and breadth of Helene, it didn't quite matter what you had in place uh, from a community college perspective. It, it took out power and any terrestrial aerial line uh, that was available to those 14 colleges. And very similar on the UNC um, side. So three impact campuses, App State, UNC Asheville, Western Carolina. Uh, like Patrick said, we had um, a myriad of different issues, but you know, cell coverage in the mountains is always challenged anyway. Um, then you layer on all the uh, power and internet outages, um, and then uh, it was it was really devastating here for a few days. But Asheville definitely got the worst of it. I think, as Patrick mentioned, uh, MCNC did restore services, I believe, within four or five days. Um, so it was actually pretty remarkable how quickly they got back online. Um, I'm talking with the CIO at Asheville. I think their their equipment um, was remained dry. So they they actually weathered uh, the, the storm really well, uh, as we did at App State and Western Carolina. So I think all in all, we were very fortunate, but appreciative of all the uh, extraordinary efforts by, by so many. <coughs> And from a state perspective, we're still tracking 12 state locations without connectivity. Uh, and again, as Pokey mentioned, half of those are still tied to Frontier as the um, as the service provider. So um, we stand prepared, uh, ready to assist or whatever, but we've had no uh, 
no outreach yet for anything like equipment, loaner equipment, anything along those lines. Um, it does look like for the most part, um, the local government communities have been very resilient in being able to recover on their own, at least at the moment. So again, we're here to help out in any way we can. Um, uh, moving away from Helene, uh, as hard as that gets to imagine, uh, also in December, we're going to be doing the Hour of Code. That is an effort to get out across all the middle schools in the state to start introducing middle school students um, to STEM related type activities. Uh, this is something that's done in conjunction with Accenture as our partner. In this case, when I got here about uh, three years ago, um, Accenture was basically doing it in the local area. It was basically Wake and, and Durham counties that got the benefit of, of this. Um, over the course of the time, we've now been getting that extended out further and further. And this year, Accenture has made the commitment, provided that the local school districts will allow the opportunity to occur. Uh, we're prepared to um, provide something to every school district here in the state of North Carolina. Um, that'll occur the week of, what is that, the 9th through the, is that right, Nicole, I got that right, the week of the 9th of December? Yes. Right, and during that entire week. So. Some will be in person, some will be getting done virtually. Um, um, we have to be respective of school districts and what their security requirements are and pre-registration and vetting of strangers coming into a school. Um, so probably the preponderance of them will be virtual versus in person. Um, but uh, we did um, last year, as an example, just by happenstance, um, it, it was uh, in October, happened to go down to Columbus School District take a look at something, their CTE program, their superintendent was there, mentioned this program. She opened every middle school in Columbus County to us. We did it over two days virtually. Um, and the feedback we got was phenomenal. To include some young female middle school students making a comment of how awesome it was to see a, a female leading the effort. You know, so, I mean, that's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to that outreach. If you went to their uh, CTE curriculum, um, the entire tech sector area was all men, all boys, no girls. Um, and it's just in Columbus County, too. I think if I remember correctly, Superintendent told me they have about 20 percent of, of their students are, are at home in agriculture community. Right? They're, they're working, they're homeschooled, so they're not getting exposed to the, the areas of opportunity that are out there. So um, again, we'll see. Hopefully we can make this a huge success. Um, and I don't know if you have anything more, Nicole, that you might want to add to that, not to put you on the spot. No, it's okay. Well, yeah, we're partnering with Accenture, and um, last we talked to them, I think it was nine school systems had signed up, so they're doing another push, um, understanding that some things have been lifted with the hurricane, but um, including Columbus County school systems, but we're trying to get across the state as much as possible, um, and we're going to be doing a call for volunteers. We'll make sure that that invite gets to you all too if you're interested. Again, like Jim said, most will be virtual, we believe. It's based on the school systems and being able to get volunteers in person. Um, I know Wake County is, I believe they have a kind of parallel uh, program. Um, and then Mecklenburg County is always one that typically participates as well. With 114 LBAs, how do you guys get, how do they hear about it and learn of the program? Communications is a challenge for us, Jeff. I mean, we've been working through DPI, all, every avenue that we can to get to our an outreach to um, the school districts we're trying. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it gets caught up in a superintendent's inbox and then it doesn't go any further and then we miss out on an opportunity. Um, now we're going to the principals. We, we got some feedback from the superintendents. Now we're going to principals, but we're using every possible avenue we yeah. have, coordinating with the governor's office. And, is DPI you know, helpful? Legislator. Yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, they're very much interested. So uh, Jeff Coltrane from the governor's team is, is helping us out as, as tremendously. Um, we have Vanessa, um, CIO there for DPI, actively involved as well. Um, and they do some other things, too. So we're trying to marry this all together and, and wow. just try to bring a last year's thing was a, it was around. Um, it was an introduction to AI, but basically they had to create a bot that had identified trash from fish in the ocean. Then it was um, no, it was marine life from trash, and then it was identifying fish from other various types of marine life. Then it was getting down to identifying happy fish, <laughs> which then allowed you to talk about bias and some other things, right? Yeah. Because a fish with a bushy eyebrows was not deemed a happy fish by the bot. 
I mean, it wasn't a happy fish. It just had bushy eyebrows. Um, but in, so it opened up some opportunities to talk about some of those things in a different light. Um, and as you can imagine, in middle school, you still got Johnny kicking Susie under the table and, and different things. And then you have other kids that are a little bit more mature and they're boom, 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 and they're like, what else? <laughs> you know, and so you have that that that, ver that variation of skill sets, but it, it was extremely fun to go out there and participate and interact with the students. Um, and so if 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 you're able to do so, I really encourage you to try to, to help us out here on that one. Sorry, I'll add one other thing to that yeah. uh, to your question, Jeff. It's we have a lot of support in helping communicate. It's just and and actually that response we got, well, holistically it may seem small. I mean, we're still if we've grown it, I don't even know what percent is, but we're you know, it's growing. This is the first year we've done it statewide. So that's still and that will be more. Um, but we provide more information to you and you all can just help. Yeah. Communicate about last it. Last year was over. We got 148 middle school classrooms and over 8,000 yeah. kids. And that's wow. districts. I don't know numbers of classrooms when we were talking about systems this year, but um, that way you can help promote it for next year too, because I, I know this will continue to be a program. It's um, yeah. it's a great opportunity. Okay, uh, just moving on real quick. Uh, to some other things, some recognition for the state. So um, both at NASIO and E Republic. If two years ago you may recall that the state first time ever got an A grade from E Republic, it was a myriad of things. Um, contrary to popular belief, it wasn't creative writing done by Sarah Porper and Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> there are some good things that are occurring here in this state, but uh, uh, those two uh, ladies had uh, told a really, really compelling story for how good things are in North Carolina. This being more perfect, but for the first time ever, we got an A grade. Follow that up here this year, we got an A grade again. So not only, um, and we were one of six states last two years ago, we were one of nine states this time around as well. Um, along the same lines, uh, our GIS team. Uh, so Tim Johnson and his team that supports the state from a GIS aspect, um, we're the only state that got an A grade. Um, there were some local entities um, in District of Columbia, which is not a state, but uh, yes. And so very proud of the accomplishments of our GIS team. And if you happen to go out and look at a broadband mapping and you look at what Pokey, if you go to look at what Pokey has in the NMAC, you will see our GIS team. It's all about mapping and, and bringing that bit, that presentation of various data layers together and, and really gets a comprehensive view of, of what's occurring in the state of North Carolina. So just phenomenal work that our our folks are doing even to the point now that with the devastation that's occurred in Western North Carolina, they're already working on ortho imagery because the world has changed out there. Right. Um, and so it's um, they're already on top of that, especially with the fall foliage now coming down. It allows for to to get those pictures and capture that imagery um, and they will be doing what they need to do to update maps accordingly. Um, uh, just final finalize here from a Gartner conference perspective. A couple of us in many agency had staff down at the Gartner conference. Um, AI, of course, as you would imagine, was the big topic. Um, and so interestingly enough, first time I ever heard Gartner kind of say pump the brakes on AI. Um, they basically talked about a dual race that's occurring. One's the vendor technology use race and the other one's the adoption race. And of course, we can control the adoption race. Uh, they also unveiled, uh, they call it their Gen AI sandwich architecture um, but really if you think about a sandwich the two slices of bread unstructured data structured data um, and then as you look at bring your own ai as you look at embedded ai and SaaS based solutions um, there's an introduction now of a of a concept called tr uh, trism it's uh trust responsibility um, and security management um, and that's an area now where they're projecting there's going to be a lot of um, developmental work done across the vendor community to start how to, especially from a public sector, how do you incorporate the risk based types of things that you need to do as you look at how AI is getting implemented across the board. Um, some more on that. Um, and we look to the next five years, and I know this is a topic that we're going to talk about um, with Tracy's paper. It's what is AI going to require? And so power, it's, you know, the increase in power uh, requirements that are going to be there. Um, 10x the, the consumption of power at a minimum. Uh, machines will now be drinking water. Uh, we start thinking about the impact to our environment and different things. Uh, the concept now guardian agents is what it was called, but it's now AI checking on AI. 
um, and how do you incorporate that into it? Um, obviously, more AI is inevitable. It's going to come. There's projection in five years. There'll be more drones than people um, as well, which was interesting to on here. And then the other thing that really was in interesting was including behavioral health type experts on your AI developmental efforts. Um, we talked a lot about um, the impact of AI and the HR concerns or issues that could come as a result. So an example would be a call center worker who's got five years of experience bringing at a certain level of sophistication. Having an AI tool is probably not going to provide a lot of value to that person, but now a six month junior call center worker very quickly can get up to the same level as the person who's there at five years. Now, do you have an equity issue? When you look at seniority and, and different things, and so there's some unintended consequences that are now starting to occur from looking at HR. They talked about attorneys, um, and AI wouldn't necessarily benefit a junior attorney. It's going to benefit a senior attorney, which was an interesting thought process um, as well. So again, they're, they're strongly recommending as we look at AI and AI development opportunities, bring the social scientists bring the behavioral health person into these conversations early on so you can start accounting for some of these concerns and, and, and areas of focus that need to be addressed because they will come up. I think that's probably a good place to stop. I, I, Dylan, I don't think there's anything legislatively right at the moment, right? The, the, it's focused on uh, Western North Carolina, rightfully so. Um, and I think we're good. Jonathan, anything from Chief Operating Officer? Everything goes. Okay. Jim, thank you. I think we should tie now into, if yeah. you wouldn't mind there, Mr. Chair, tie into Tracy's uh, document or paper. Yeah, Ed, not just mine. Uh, I, so I'm the Chief Information Officer at Duke. Um, for a, a long time at Duke, we have aggregated computational needs from labs into the central environment so that the spiky nature of the projects get averaged out and we can most effectively leverage the aggregate amount of capacity we have. That's worked well for all of us at universities for many decades to support our researchers. However, now GPUs make for a different kind of beast and environment. Um, in, in one regard, the number of these that you need to amass together to work on the kinds of large projects that Jim talks about um, are, can be daunting for an individual campus. So together with the CIOs at Ch UNC Chapel Hill and at NC State, we've started talking about how we can aggregate the capacity of these graphics processing units, the thing that power AI, to support our researchers, but more generally. Um, that's, that's been a really great conversation, and it acknowledges a bunch of things, including the fact that we can also serve smaller schools uh, with that same infrastructure. So as Jim's talking about how we train people in middle schools, the first thing I say is where are they going to get that computational capacity? Um, and so the three university CIOs, and then most recently with Jim, we've begun talking about what would the world look like in North Carolina if we could aggregate that GPU capacity in a way that everybody at Duke benefits, in a way that new jobs are created, in a way that energy costs mean we could be lowered and mean we would have lower costs to operate the facilities. And so we've got a sort of a vision paper amongst the, the small group of us that we're starting to share with others uh, to see whether there's a good agreement that if we can amass GPUs together, that probably also means building a um, huge, large data center that is designed with uh, low cost and energy efficiency in mind in order to deal with, as, as Jim points out, 10 times the power consumption of these things, in order to deal with the fact that the newest chips require to be most uh, cost effective, liquid cooling, which means you're actually running water right right along the chips, right, to cool them down. Um, well, let's put together with that the fact that when we get the hot water back, 
lots of our universities and hospitals and military bases and everything else, we actually need hot water to run our 24 seven operations. And so how do we think about this, not just as GPUs that consume a lot of energy, but GPUs that once we aggregate, we might put into a facility that wouldn't just take that energy and just, it's, it's like in the, in the winter, if I heat my pool, I see the steam coming off. And that's not really steam, that's money, right? Those are dollars that are moving away. Um, same kind of thing, if all we're doing with the energy from these GPUs, releasing it into the environment or otherwise. So, um, so we've been talking about how we would do this, how this could be a facility if we could aggregate the capacity, if we could put it in a facility that was very cost effective relative to the alternatives. Um, how could it serve as much as possible at the state? How could it serve not only the universities, the community colleges, K through 12, the state, the state agencies, startups that come out of our universities and all face the same problems, other startups? How could we use that to do more economic development and make North Carolina really a destination uh, for, for so much of this kind of work, including training our citizenry, uh, who aside from the jobs creation that we heard earlier from, uh, from Gerald is, is aimed at a particular group in a particular area, boy AI uh, awareness and ability to do this prompt engineering work. People really need to learn how to do that if they're going to be appropriately capable uh, workforce citizens in the next 10, 20 years. So we've been working on this. Um, not all of you have seen the paper, right? Jim's been involved, uh, Jeff and Rocco saw it, so they wouldn't be surprised today. Um, but we're really trying to start thinking about this and um, and in conversation with, with Sarah, who's also seen it, you know, we were wondering about this as it might relate to the state and even the IT strategy board, right? Mm -hmm. Whether this is something that, um, that we would want to circulate or talk about more generally and decide whether we put a, a stamp of approval on this or or how this how this works uh, here. So that's a little bit of an introduction to it. I can say more, but I, actually I can like talk for a week on it. Uh, but I know we don't want that. Uh, so let me turn it back over and see what other. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah, let me just add on to that, Tracy. So a uh, the concept that's going on in the private sector is the AI factory model. Um, so you are no longer taking your data AI, you're bringing AI to where your data sits. So it's a little bit of a uh, transition away necessarily from anything about cloud computing, although cloud can be very easily defined, someone else's equipment, someone else's data center. Um, but um, it's kind of like, I don't want to say bring it back on prem, but it's kind of what the concept is um, in these AI factories. North Carolina regional cloud. Right, right. Right, and and so I will also tell you at the state level, we don't own any GPUs. The GPU is 65K. Okay. It takes months to get, um, and that's for one. And we don't have, we, our data center next door does not have the capability or the capacity at the moment to even begin to run this type of, of power of compute. Um, we have a hard time now meeting some of Mark's requirements for uh, racks that he needs for the gaming uh, degree curriculum that they're running over at NC State. So they're actually looking to maybe move somewhere um, differently as well. Can you do AI on CPU base? Yeah, you can, but you know, it's going to take forever. I you think math be, math yeah, math too. from hours to days <laughs> to, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. yes, exactly. Um, and so that's not the most, um, probably the, the best solution to it all. So this concept here of could we create an AI factory for the state of North Carolina, leveraging the capabilities and the needs of our major universities here, and maybe not necessarily, but all our, you know, our education, higher ed colleagues, bring in and allow the state to come in there and be able to be a, a consumer of that compute. What could that model possibly look like? And could we do it in a, in a manner that's environmentally friendly? Um, because again, uh, Gardner mentioned, and you know, I'm glad you brought up, what do you do with the hot water? Yep. Right. When this is done. Um, and so, you know, you just don't go, <laughs> you know, running it out, you know, through a drain tube out into the, into the environment. Uh, so you have all those kind of factors that need to be considered as well. So if you all recall a couple months ago, Tracy had talked about looking at doing something a little bit differently. And I think now, as we look at, um, you were looking at geothermal, you know, all kinds of Quantum different things, control. right? And as we all know, Duke also has a small quantum computing 
capability as well, which is something that we at the state level have not even talked about yet at quantum computing. How can we harness, harness this all together? Um, and so, as I said in my email to you two gentlemen, I, I don't know that we have a legislative ask. I mean, I don't know if we're far enough along, but this is something that I think the state needs to invest in at some point in time when it becomes. Well, obviously, this this relates to our strategic objective for yes. this for this board. I mean, this is obviously the next really important strategic objective. And some of the things we're talking about, obviously, are the tactical how we're going to do this, but it would be useful if the board can help educate some of the legislators on what this means, what the needs are, um, how the state might participate. Jeff talked about this earlier. You know, if we can characterize this in a fashion that this is actually going to be a job creator as opposed to a job eliminator, and that at some point um, it may actually pay for itself in economic development here in the state. And so there are a number of points that we as the as the board, as a strategy board and interfacing with the legislature need to step up and help try to champion this, this cause and this initiative. Obviously, this is going to be a game changer. And the next five years are going to be just remarkable in what we're going to see develop in this. I can't really conceive of where we'll be 10 years from now with, with all of this, but it's going to be a very different environment at that point. So. Yeah, the only thing I know is we don't know where we'll be in 10 years, but we know if we don't get rolling soon, right, we'll we're be, going to be in somebody else's dust, right? That's right. Well, we always said this is Moore's Law, right? Technology doubles every year and a half or so. Question, here's for the room. You're all IT people. How many people have ever written a piece of code that's processed on an IBM 370? Oh man, you <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, did anyone want to admit to that? <laughs> That's me. That's how old. But here's the fun part. Guess what? IBM 370s were water cooled. So it's everything's. This is a white time. It's white yeah, time. Yeah, Change uh, ones, right? The same, right? Yeah, right. it's fascinating. And if you don't do water cooled, then your your density of your racks is going to have to be. Oh. You're wasting. The only, place they said, yeah, the only place you can do this is in a vacuum or in outer space. And if, you all, if you ever get a chance to go out to Lenovo and actually see, they've already showed their processing boards where, I mean, it is. It's almost like a little mini radiator going through no different than your car, right? right. And, and you think about it. It's such a fascinating thing because we talked about we really need data centers at the state level for what we're doing. Should we be competing with the cloud computing the AWS? No, probably not. Changes totally. Maybe we are the data center for the entire state. I mean, well, this is yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I, and I don't mean the state. I mean every entity in the state, not the state of North we, Carolina. We have some challenges with our data center next door. Let's be honest. I mean, sure. we look sure. at you look at that building. You look at the cost. We, we're right. going through the process now of putting perimeter fencing up. Um, the guardrails really don't do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about that kind of stuff, well, you even and, and, we're, available there. and we're capped by the energy, we're capped by the power grid that exists here in the city of Raleigh, and as this state and city continues to um, expand, that power grid is going to be extremely valuable. So we're going to have to end up going somewhere where power and these other natural resources are more readily available anyway, I think, in the long term. Um, and if it's a multi-state entity venue, I mean, again, go back to cloud, someone else's equipment, someone else's data center. Um, well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we theoretically should have the intellectual capacity to wrestle this to the ground. In a sense, you, you're merging, collaborating with the university right. environment, and you're collaborating with the best and brightest in DIT and but stuff. I think what would be helpful, especially from your perspective, Jeff, as being a former legislator, is what are the things that we need to make sure that are in this concept paper that sure. would be our blind like, spots. Yeah, right. Exactly. Because like I said, I don't I don't know that there we're at a point where we can get look at the sure. next annual budget and say and, and hey, the legislator, can you help us? Because who do you need to talk to begin with? And who yeah. across that way? Right. However, all Duke needs to do is raise basketball ticket prices <laughs> and he can pay for this whole thing, right? <laughs> Assuming that, yeah, well, we're already pretty deep into discussions at Duke for how we could do this in a kind of starting capacity. Yeah. It wouldn't be where we all need to be, but it would at least get us started. It might give Mark a little place to proof put of some of his yeah. Mark. Exactly. And it would be the proof of concept that we could measure. And right. then 
in a year or two, right, then you can start to talk to people about saying, here's here's the reduction in cost, right? Here's here's how effective it was in capacity growth collectively. Um, and and now you're talking about, okay, how do we build it bigger? Yeah. Rocco Joe has her hand up. Uh, Rocco Joe. Oh, Joe, yeah. Joe, I'll come. Sorry, Joe. That's okay. Hi, everybody. Sorry I couldn't be there in person today. Um, Tracy, you talked about this a little bit in the last uh, digital strategy committee meeting we had, and for what it's worth, I think it's an absolutely fabulous, super exciting idea. My question is, um, <laughs> does, is anybody on your team aware of anybody else doing this in the country? Any other entities that perhaps we could learn from? Or is yeah, this like a, a, a brand new idea? Well, no, I mean, there, there's no such thing as brand new ideas. They're all like morphs of something else that's come before. Um, there are two things I, I could say. Uh, one is that several other universities are starting to look at their own aggregation. Uh, but to my knowledge, there's not something that spans not only higher ed, but also state government, right, and, and potentially startups and otherwise, which is where I think this has very important value. So that's one. Uh, a second is that um, these concepts about the, the heat reuse, right, and, and using that as a system that helps to lower the cost generally by making sure there is no waste, even for something like hot water, right, or hot air that seems like it should be waste. Um, that is a concept that uh, I've, I've seen referred to in more of some academic papers, um, but not in a practice like this. I have, um, th there is, uh, Google does have some heat reuse work that they do. I believe it's in Finland uh, with a, a, a city in Finland where the output from their Google factories uh, ends up powering parts of the city. So there's a component there, but again, that's Google just as their entity. The third one I would say site is uh, Massachusetts has what's called a Green High Performance Computation Center, the MGH. You see? So they say um, that fast. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, they started that about 10 years ago. Uh, it's a large facility, mainly for the, the universities up there, um, and not so much designed for uh, AI and GPU work. It's uh, hydro powered, so it has some of the green aspects and the G in the name, green high performance compute. Um, so there are some components of the model. I would say that this one is, I think, um, pretty distinctive in terms of putting lots of those together at a point in time where we could really take off and leapfrog everything else. Uh, that's, that's yeah, I mean, I think it could be a great differentiator. And um, since you mentioned Massachusetts, I was aware that they are way ahead in terms of sustainability. They've done a lot. Even the, the Blue Cross plan in Massachusetts has done quite a bit. And Joe, there's a group I floated this paper by that I've been working with that is developed a new pedagogy for doing manufacturing uh, operations. So it's basically where you have a problem to solve. It needs to be solved immediately. And it ha there's no uh, iterating through it working. It has to work on the first time through. And this kind of model, how you grow it, uh, fits pretty well into that. Now, it's a group that works at the company and works in the lab in Chantilly. So mm -hmm. they're all PhDs, all double E's and mechanical engineers, and they work for that funny little three-letter organization that works internationally. So they're fascinated by this. And they're working That's on great. drone They're going to show up at my house, are they? They should. <laughs> but th th this... We'll send some three-letter agencies your way. <laughs> this, this is... You, you're on to the thing, I think, for us. Oh, thank you. It is really awesome. As part of the, as part of the development of the paper, you talk a little bit about the use of, you know, the discharge of, of heat. Yes. And putting it back into a loop so you lower the cost. Have you considered power in? You, you look at all the big players in the AI space, they're all yeah, fighting for power. Right right? Right. And so we're going to compete theoretically with those big players for power. How do you guys handle that? Yeah, um, 
So power is certainly a limiting factor or, I mean, the good news I think for our region is because we're Duke Energy powered, um, they're already, you know, making good progress and, you know, they've got nuclear is one of their, you know, one of their key, um, key areas of continuing development. I, I will say, I joked, uh, Duke, Duke houses uh, the TRNL, Triangle Research Nuclear Lab. It's on our campus. I contacted our professor of physics and said, hey, can we use the TRNL? To well, uh, uranium? Said, probably, not, probably not enough. He said, but he'd be happy to build me a, new, a mini reactor if I could get him a new physics building. So there may be a deal <laughs> off in here somewhere. But, but, so but Kate, to your point, though, one of the, the things that Gardner's projecting over the next five years is this concept of microgrids. Yeah, right. um, and it will be consumer generated microgrids looking to sell power back because, and also consuming the power that's going to be dr uh, driven by AI. Yeah, I know a couple people, residents who are using geothermal to, to cool their own house and, and air conditioning right here in the area. To Rocco and Jeff's point, when we go back to legislature or legislation, le legislators, and they want to understand the impact of the economy, it's not only the, the AI data center for the state, so and anything that comes out of it, meaning how do you put the industry back in, in a positive way, but it's also the development and growth of the energy sector in the state to support those things. Right. It's a really big ecosystem that if you can capture information on all of those, exactly. it gives a much better opportunity. Yeah, and, and yeah. you know, to Joe's point, anybody else doing this, I mean, I, I see North Carolina as better positioned than any place I can imagine to do this. Because of rooms like this, you know, I'm also on MCNC's board, right? The three universities work together, even though Jim thinks we only fight on the basketball. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a it's a place where people are willing to collaborate and and ready to do it. So I feel I feel really. Well, remember, awesome. my general counsel is a Tar Heel, so that's what I've been <laughs> embedded here. So yeah. <laughs> but, Tracy, I need you to add to my collection. All right. I'm trying to be politically correct today. Yeah, I was going to say, don't you do kind of the other? Yeah, so I, I don't know, Rocco, how you might want to proceed, but I think this is something, like I said, it's, it's, I don't think we're, I don't, there's no, nothing for us to carry to the legislature yet, but I think the concept needs to be Explored. explored and some education there so they understand that this could be coming in two years. This is something. I think you he, have set the foundation even in we'll talk about the annual report because AI is one of the four cornerstones, right? Yeah. And this becomes the keystone within the cornerstone of AI for everyone. So yeah, it's interesting because I can go around the country. A lot of people don't know much about North Carolina, but they know RTP. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. A lot of times they yeah, they don't yeah they forget RTP is you know. So have country. you encountered discussions of anything similar to this topic with other state CIOs? Uh, no, not at the moment. Um, as part of NASIO, we did have some focus on AI, and the conversation did come up about the environmental. Like, do we fully understand? And even when I was at NGA, I asked um, OpenAI, their government affairs person was there, and I asked, how do you calculate the call, total cost of ownership for an AI initiative? And she admitted that it was never asked that question before. Like, I work off a of biannual budget. I don't have the ability to sit here and adjust fire on an annual basis. Um, so something going to cost me 100 bucks a month, $15,000 a month, or yeah, 100000 a month when we think about because what they were trying to do is really promote very strongly AI and providing of governmental services and engagement of citizens. Sure. Everybody wants to do that. We agree. But tell me how I, what's the cost models look like and how do we, and we start thinking about all these other ancillary outputs, if you will, that have to be factored into that. Power increase, usage, water, da, 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 all this other stuff. What does the total cost of ownership model look like? And it was crickets. Um, and I think, for many of my colleagues across the country, we are outside of a co-pilot or a Gemini implementation. It's more personal productivity. I don't think there's enough empirical data yet to actually get to what that cost model looks like. So when I go to Director Walker and Mike comes back with 10 questions on my numbers, I can at least defend my numbers. <laughs> because again, if we fund a thing, this thing, something over here is not getting funded, right? There's not a, yeah, Kristen's not pushing or printing money at a, 
I, I do think you're on to something, though, in terms of the, you, you, you can relate to this, but the psychology of how you talk to this with the legislature and there's, you know, folks have so many concerns or issues, some founded, some misinformation around AI, but I think looking at it from a standpoint of what other economies you're building around it and positioning sort of a la what, um, you know, um, Singapore did 30 years ago around microtrip uh, processing industries and what got the infrastructure resources they had to build to that resulted into what we have today. <clears throat> Anyways, I can't think of a state better positioned with some of the natural resources that we have to take advantage of this and invest you know, executive and legislative branches investing with universities and other folks to build these other ancillary economies around this. Um, and that might be a strategic way to frame it to capture the ear of some legislators who might otherwise be slightly resonant around AI and where well, that's North going. Carolina, the delegation, it's not just, it's beyond just the state legislature with this topic because yeah. the fed, federal delegation is massively concerned about what China's positioning uh, in the tech area. Uh, so yeah, Ted Bud actually is on the IT side uh, at the federal level, so they're in the middle of some of this stuff. So this is another avenue. And, and we've had the, the privilege of uh, spending time with Congresswoman Ross and Fauci, um, Sheree and I on their AI roundtables. And so we did have one roundtable that was specific to outside of us. It was basically higher ed. Sure. Um, and R&D and all of these kind of things were very much at the, the forefront of um, of why this is so important of a topic to us, especially when you look at the success of RTP. I mean, the R is research. <laughs> yeah. I think this notion of the resources is, is absolute light, right? North Carolina also with MCNC is a network that connects everything mm -hmm. in the state. Mm -hmm. We could get to the point where we could have these distributed AI factories yeah. throughout the state really, interconnected right. in a really sure. powerful and way. And if we look at possible, I don't know, I mean, depending upon the timeline for Western North Carolina, it might be an opportunity there to do something in Western North Carolina to help Absolutely. recover. Absolutely, help, help right. recover, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then there's also, in addition to the resources and the physical network, there's the sort of the figurative network, the people network. Um, just yesterday, I read into this concept a uh, faculty member in our School of Business who is taking an appointment next month to be the chief economist for OpenAI, right? And so he's, oh, this is good. How can how can we, how can OpenAI work together with the state and what it's trying to do? So I think there's great potential here. So he has like a uh, hundred suggestions for OpenAI. <laughs> Your point, though, you know, this isn't just one campus, one location. I mean, yeah, you're not yeah. going to get the energy density to be able to do that. This is really a distributed architecture. That's right. And if you're trying to reuse the heat, you want to reuse it everywhere, right? right? Not exactly. just in one place. Yeah. So, so you know, I think you, you start and then you grow it, yeah. right? And then obviously with MCNC, is sort of underpinning the network mm -hmm. between these. It's, yes. you know. And the, and the research at the universities helps us start to uncover the answers to how do we have North Carolina as a statewide data center, right? Mm -hmm. With 50 different places right. that we can bring that power together. That takes people who are really smart computer science and engineers and network engineers to figure out how that process mm -hmm. works. Exactly. we got 10 years left because as I told you earlier, it's predicted 2035, the internet will cease to exist. It, there will be something that replaces it. And these are the types of things that build the foundation to do that. You know, and Europe's struggling with this too because GDPR doesn't allow for their data to leave the right. European international data. They're, they're 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 limited to what they have. And you know, I was with a gentleman. For, I think I may have told you before. before he worked for England's DoD, but he had told me that England was kicking and down the road on their green initiatives another five years because they just can't generate the power. They got to go back to fossil fuel to be able to. Keep up. And that, yeah. Those compliance issues are significant as well. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want that to be used as why GDPR is bad. It's not. <laughs> but I, a good thing for the most part. Yeah, there's some tweaks, but okay. And you think at some point, that, sorry, one more comment. At some point, not only because of the breadth of what we're talking about, but the way it brings together an entire ecosystem. And we've got to think about, you know, power plants and generation and hydro and all the other possibilities, and, it yeah. really becomes something that's bigger than any of us, right? And becomes something that really needs to be thought about as, you know, potentially something at, at a statewide level to, to really amass the savings across an entire ecosystem. Yeah. 
and the awareness of it. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions for Tracy on this? When will it be operational? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're trying to drive as fast as we can for something on campus to be a, a test bed um, that we could could use to learn from this lesson. Do you have a target for the publication of the paper? Uh, no. Uh, um, but I, I think we're closing in on it. I need to get some more conversation with Jim and make sure from him. I'd welcome other thoughts you know, from those who know state government and legislatures better than I do, uh, which is zero. Uh, welcome thought from Joe or others, right, from the, the industry standpoint. Yeah. There's a just perspective on what will resonate. Yep. Okay. Okay. Soon, Keith, soon. Um, Good. I'm interested in reading it. We're uh, here with what we are. We are um, talking about the annual report. Okay. So, you know, I think our objectives, as we had laid out last year, have not changed all that much. However, a greater focus probably on AI than we even had last year, although we were talking about it at the time. That's probably going to want to be one of the, as, as Jeff had pointed out, uh, you know, a cornerstone of what we're going to talk about this year. Um, I would like for us to put together our our year end report um, over the course of the next couple of weeks, circulate that among members, get everybody to make their contributions or sign off on that, such that we have something really to present uh, year end and try to get this one in timely this year. Um, and Sarah, are you going to be able to help us with that as you have in? Yeah, we do. Okay. Okay. But um, I, I don't know how many folks have reviewed what we did last year. Um, I gave it a quick look last night, and honestly, most of the, you know, we need to continue to do what we said we were going to do last year, actually see if we can actually get some of it accomplished in the coming year. How many people have seen in the, the report, the room? From last year, you mean? Last year? Yeah. 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 And, this year. and then this year, basically, like you said, with the, at least the version that I've seen, the latest one for 20, that we're posturing is February 24. Yeah. So, and so how much do we see it changing? Not much, you said, right? Not a lot. I just think we need to bring it to focus a little bit more. Sure. The yeah, AI feedback from it. all of you guys, too. I yeah. mean, you guys live in it day to day, and you go, you know, this is a bunch of crud. That makes no sense at all uh, from what you guys are talking about. So it would be really helpful that we distribute it. And Jim, you need to bless and say, yeah, this fits in well with direction where I see this going, needing to go. Um, you know, whether, you know, what happens after the elections uh, with the office, if you're committing to a 10 year contract, which would be great. Um, so all of those things become important that everybody has kind of eyes on looks at it and says, hey, we're getting this key piece. And can we bury that in there? Is there something where this is on target, you know, rather than off in left field? So I guess probably another aspect of this is to the extent that there are, that DIT has a transition document for whatever the new administration is coming in. We want to be able to hold in them. some part of what we know. We, we, well. we do have. So we are draft. We have in draft format our transition document. Governor's office obviously, you know, is looking here over the next couple of days to get that finalized. So we're on a tight time frame. We've done one draft already. It's back. We have some, you know, obviously some updates and corrections. And Helene kind of threw a curveball at all of us. And now there's a part about Helene's efforts in there as well. Um, we do talk a little bit about the ITSB in the document. Um, because again, as we go through statutory authority, ITSB is part of DIT, so we do have sure. that in there. Um, but otherwise, it, it's about a 50-page document focused on the things that the governor wants to make sure that is being handed off to the next administration. So um, I don't think we're at a place yet where we can uh, make copies outside of the Gov's office available yet. Say. My pretty rough. Don't, don't say it, it depends, it's Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> now it's pretty rough right now. I yeah. mean, I think that probably we're I mean, happy to share it. It's just probably right now. It's yeah, and that's good to yeah. even rough format, keeping it confidential. Or even just 
to the, the, to the members. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. it would yeah. be relevant information. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be fine. Any of the black work that's going on, we probably don't need to be read in on. <laughs> Being respectful of the boss, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so am I hearing that that would be available to the board members here and that? I mean, I, I, I can't think of a reason. Well, you know, after the election and once the transition team starts coming, I yeah. don't think it then I think it would be pretty public. <laughs> well, and again, I think that transition team and it, unless something, another Helene hits, I mean, when you're up by 21 points, it's, it will take an earthquake to change the, the direction. You know, that team will want to be up to speed and direction. My recommendation is that maybe we can, um, you know, we can kind of coordinate on, because not everything in the document is relevant to what you need. Sure. Or it's, you know, things, I mean, it's very basic, but maybe coordinate on the information that could help inform you all of the decisions and we can, if there's something to add from on our end to coordinate that way, maybe. Sure. That might be the better well, You do way realize do. we're a bunch of nerds on this side. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Sarah, sort of the takeaway on this is over the next, I'm going to say three weeks or so, we just want to polish this up a little bit. Um, we want to have it circulated such that by the time we come to our December 20 meeting, that we can take everybody's temperature and get signed off by everybody on <coughs> your end. And Tim, a question for you would be, and I don't think we need an answer. My attorney's in the room here, so I, I might play the deaf with that's you that's asking. Because <laughs> it's really, yeah, it depends. It's perfect. It is something to think about. Do you want it to be a standalone document or like an appendix to the overall DID annual report? I mean, depending how you want to posture, that's for you to decide. We, we could. Okay. All right. Rocco and Jeff, just in terms of the annual report, want to make sure. Did you want to do any kind of brainstorming or collecting input? Now, or you want the board members to? I, I would give it to the board members. I'd give it to everybody that sits in on this meeting and say, give us your two cents. Just give us feedback. Anything where you need your topic areas or things. I, I'm, I'm going to put Sarah on the spot and I'm going to pay later for doing this. But <laughs> <laughs> well, and you can well, take I mean, a look. I know you've been thinking about this in, in all sincerity to, to a little bit, but it just if there anything like off the top of your mind that you think are areas that sensitive already in there. Um, so part of it is we didn't get as much um, publicity about this document last time around. So the members of the general assembly is going to be. I think the idea is have it done by theoretically December in the next, you know, eight weeks or so. We can say, hey, it's done. And then we can talk about with you or whomever. Uh, who do we take this in front of in the legislature and how do we posture it and with key topics and. Well, it's going to be, we, I mean, obviously we're going to have some leadership changes, especially yeah, for IT. Okay. Now, so maybe, add, or maybe not. I can also add, we're working to have the agency annual report come right. in early December too. Right. So kind of in the same time frame. So I think it makes sense for us to talk because we, I mean, we reference all the boards, so right. it could be, we can definitely talk about how they kind of mesh together or sure. if it's an appendix or if we just link, but it gets, it can be shared along with ours because we do distribute it. So sure. we'll, we're going to get it widely out and we have a um, legislative newsletter that goes out, vendors sure. sign up for it. So uh, there's a number of ways that we can. Here to help you guys, not us. Yeah. So I think that could help. I mean, but, but we can talk, Sarah, we can coordinate Figure more out. on that, but timing wise. I, I, you know, just again, just for, I'll, I'll just put my purview hat on here for a second. We really need to start hammering away at digital transformation. Okay, um, yeah, so it's got to be in there, and that's got to be an area. And, and I, you know, I do have that as a um, that? as an issue. Yep, it was a major component of the right, last major, year. major. So, right, I mean, but it got no traction. Right, so, so we figure out how to do that. We have to figure we out how to get traction for that. Right. right? No, we don't. Um, AI obviously is going to be a big thing, big but deal. with AI then comes around those efforts around data. It's going to come around our efforts with privacy and yeah. then how we're securing it all as well. Um, 
are, are we prepared to to embark upon some type of, and I said to Sheree the other day, uh, a skeletal privacy, yeah. not not something that's like the state of Washington or some or California or something to that extent, but just to get a toehold of, we do need. Um, it still resonates with me where Microsoft's general counsel said the first thing, if you're going to do AI, you need to have privacy. Have you guys looked at NCSL as a resource? Yes. Well, and, and Jason and Jason was Jason was the yeah. on NCSL. Oh, I, I don't know if if you know Jeff if there's somebody else now who's going to be backfilling his position on that. But how about saying, yeah, yeah, probably John. But we, okay. if, but they won't actually know until they see the first caucus, which won't happen until well, it won't happen after the elections. And right. committee chairs could be named as early as December prior to uh, taking and going into session, but. Sometimes it's right after the long session starts, so it, it's probably into January, early February, candidly. They'll have some idea because, and again, I, and again, that'll be the next administration's call as to whether or not there's any kind of move sure. forward movement. But we're going to have that mentioned as part of you know well, the transition plan. With you, even transition wise, would mm -hmm. not be bad to sit down with Hall and Berger in a small group and say, okay, here's what's coming. Who do you? You know, yeah. get close to. The other thing that's just a practical matter is if not in this report somewhere else, we need to articulate the concern of having potential for the whole board turning over at one time. Yeah, it's another, we yeah, I, we don't have that mentioned, but we should reference yeah. that. Now we stagger. Right. Mm -hmm. Poor Rocco becomes a permanent member for life. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing I would add is just to keep in mind that the, the report and its contents are, are in the statute. So um, you have to report on projects that have been recommended, the status of the projects, and the most recent version of its five-year prioritization plan. It's the JLOC, uh, Joint Legislative Oversight Committee on IT, and the, and the FRD. Yeah, and we've got, we actually mentioned in the report we violate our Charter all the time, so <laughs> that's kind of where we start. No, we didn't do that. We were supposed to, okay. but yes, we need to probably set and foot it against the charter and the um, what we've been tasked to do by the legislature. What are we do? What have we been able to do? What we have not, mm -hmm. and just call it out. Yeah. Part of that too is is just a timing thing. If this report is due before the budget right. comes up with their yeah. expansion <laughs> items, and we work under. Yes. Governor's umbrella. So us recommending major IT projects that may or may not be yeah, part right. of the governor's recommended budget just has has caused some. It's almost know, like you used to work at the budget office. <laughs> <laughs> we were almost we have her in this role. Insight. Thank you. The disclaimer, we were all working on the lean release. It's always the chicken versus the egg conversation, yeah, right? right? Because how can I put my budget together if I don't know that's what the agencies are doing? But right. yeah. I think if we just articulate that, yeah, t-shirt, we'll be okay. Yeah. Um. I I think those are probably the major. I mean, digital transformation has just got to be a must somewhere down. I mean, it's, it's got to happen. Yeah. Um. I thought we were close. I thought we were close in 2023 session, or and we we kind of swung and missed. So there was other background noise that we had a. So we couldn't focus the fight on that, but um, I think the more specific you could be in tying, bringing it down to a project level with resource asked to it in terms of staff funding requests. So actually, I think our our subcommittee had a lot of good things. I mean, between what Tracy had spearheaded and, and Joe, and yeah, and I know Glenn as well. We had some things tied in there, like to help out Secretary of State and others and all that. Yeah, just need to have the right audience to speak. Sure. That's right. We can identify those guys. I mean, there's no magic to it. You start with the speaker and the president pro tem. Anything they don't want happens, not going to happen. Doesn't matter what the other yeah. people really say or not. As strange as that sounds. Then the next most important people to move this stuff is going to be the big chairs on the budget. There's three in the Senate and there's nine on the house. So that's a group. The next is going to be finance will be the next most important because they control individual but across. Uh, and then it's the IT 
folks. The IT candidly, as the lease say, uh, they kind of keep a tabs on it uh, a little bit and reporting back. But those other three is where all the juice is. So would it resonate more? So we've, we've written the business case multiple times, right. multiple machinations, but we have an opportunity now with lean. Like if we had online services, once networks are all about up and running, if we had them getting services to citizens might be easier than they would yeah. otherwise have been, or at least Maybe. for me. I think the first audience sets once you get what you want to take for it, you got to have a meeting with Berger and you got to have a meeting with Destin and you got to have a meeting with the new governor elect. And I mean, governor elect before he's sworn in. Uh, there's, yeah. there's time. The chief of staffs are prepared to start dealing with this so they can deal with it in the transition because I've talked to both. So uh, the other the other area, um, again, we had conversations with um, FRD around this too, is the re recurring versus non recurring funding. And so we are. We are hamstrung by, I mean, let me be very clear. We're very appreciative of the funding we get. But we have a number of cyber related initiatives that are tied to non recurring fundings and the history of the state to have a budget on July 1. It's perfect, isn't it? Yes. <clears throat> and so that, that non recurring funding does not get extended um, and it puts us in jeopardy. Um, and we sat down with FRD um, along with both on the House and the Senate side, some staffers, and we had a very, very good conversation about. So they understand the ramifications of some of these things. You know, as we ask for more recurring funding, this is why. Um, and they, they have to be educated to know that. Yeah, and most of them get. That. And, and it was it was really a good conversation. And it was informational. It was not and so like for you go back and you know no we weren't, um, but but we will be going forward in our budget submission. We are going to be asking for recurring to continue some of the work that has been already laid down because. Well, and there's no magic. Non recurring funds are infinitely easier to get approved than recurring. Yes. And, yes. and understandably why, and right? And stuff is like, we, I think we got to build the case with them that you're going to have to do this like recurring like 10 years. And if it, you don't like it, make the next legislative group cancel it rather than making them pass it because it's mm -hmm. up too many things. So, so number one recommendation we had last time around was recurring funds for cybersecurity and data yeah. privacy. Yes. So we can up some and give more that, information for this year, but it, it's in there. We got privacy and cyber too that just can't budget four weeks at a time, right? That's but, right. I mean, like I said, we, we, again, we never had recurring in 2021. That's seven and a half million. I appreciate that, but when I'm asked, what did you spend seven and a half million on? These two contracts alone just ate up that seven and a half million. The other thing that makes it interesting, which I tried to pass before I left, and it is to actually put a black group in the committee because cyber it's an interesting thing because you're in a public thing. We got into places trying to figure out what you're going to call things in the budget so people don't, the bad guys don't know what, you, what you're funding and and programs and vendors yeah. and solutions. How do you kind of keep it out of public purview? Uh, which is another struggle. So help there figuring out how to do that and communicate it. New, um, you don't need to help the bad guys understand what you're doing. So yeah, that's something we'll, we'll help how we can. We understand, you know, everything has an offset somewhere. So right, yeah. So. The, the last topic that um, was on the report last year that you haven't mentioned was the education pathways. Right. So just right. So, yeah. I have a little bit of something to say on that and on Gerald's piece of that and where we are going with that part for this year. Anything else? Yeah, we are. All right. One thing I wanted to just bring, because you were talking, we were talking about awards earlier, and you guys may all know this already, but uh, our state CIO and secretary was named by NC Tech, which represents over 600 organizations, all the universities, all, you know, all the big boys, the Accentures, the Microsofts, um, everybody. Uh, select uh, what they, one of the awards is the public leader of the year. And to give you an extent of how 
big a deal that is to think about some of the people in the past who have been selected uh, for that award. Bette Perdue, governor. Roy Cooper, governor. Mandy Cohen, who's the executive director of the CDC now. Uh, Jim Woodard, who was the former chancellor at NC State and chancellor at UNCC. And a gentleman by the name of Erskine Bowles, who happened to be the chief of staff for the president of the United States for Bill Clinton. And then this year's winner, our very own Secretary Jim Weaver. <laughs> a big deal. Come back and say, oops, it was a mistake. <laughs> it's on their website. Congratulations. Uh, no, I, I, thank you very much. And like I said, when Brooks contacted me, I was speechless, humbled, embarrassed, I, a whole bunch of different words there. But yeah, it is a quite an honor. And when I saw that list there, you know, it was just like, oh my gosh. So hopefully we set a standard for future T secretaries. Congratulations, Jim. Well, thank you all very much. I still don't know Congratulations, Jim. Hey, uh, not to be a downer here, but is everybody aware that um, Brooks lost his son? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sad time. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew in case those of you who know him wanted to reach out. Okay. Okay. Um, annual report. What's next on the list over there? Other business. So one of the things I think we probably need to address, I think in our next meeting, we should elect the next chair. Um, and so, Sarah, I think what we'll do is similar to what we did last year. We'll see if folks want to make nominations, but we will schedule a vote December 20th to select chair and vice chair. Will we have the new members coming at that meeting or? So my whole thing about that and having thought about this, Jim, is that, you know, we'll have two new members coming on. Um, obviously, Cheryl and I will be dropping off of that part of the board. Um, if we don't have a chair elected, we don't have a chair January through mm -hmm. quarter. And so I think it would be better for us to go ahead and have something established at this point, particularly if we want to try to get a few things accomplished in the coming year. Um, for the back half of this year, um, the election coming up, we just hadn't been able to get the traction that we wanted to get done. I think it would be useful to have somebody in place at that point. Um, my recommendation going forward is that we have more meetings like this. And I just think that we will cover more ground than if we wait and do it on the, on the current quarterly schedule that we have. Um, and as we do that, I think more people get engaged and that will help us sort of focus on who we need to reach out to at the legislature. Um, obviously, Jeff has a wealth of information and background on that and can help guide us on folks that the rest of us can reach out to and see if we can't actually make something happen with this board in the coming year. So I would leave that. Let me ask, John, so Jonathan, can, if they're not appointed until January 1st, they can't participate. So whether or not, or what do you, what's what do you your, they can vote if they're not members of the board. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I hear the idea of needing somebody. I wonder, what do y'all think about, you could probably do an interim person until, until such time that you reconvene in the first of the year and vote on someone full. I mean, that's common, an option. Isn't it common for the yeah. current board? to do their elections and then the new board just takes the chair and co-chair. Takes the elections of the old one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. There's a precedent of the old board holding on until the new board is fully sworn in too. So seen that happen. Okay. Also I would imagine also a vice chair, right? Right. In the right. interim capacity, mm -hmm. if the chair is no longer a member, and at least that gives also not everybody has to wear an Illinois sweater. It gives us continuity <laughs> until only for a few <laughs> only a few weeks. I think the continuity piece is is key with the number of people on the board that are going to turn over. If you won't have somebody named as the chair that can help carry the torch into the next institutional knowledge, mm -hmm. who's the the forward momentum goes, even the people that are what committees do we have? So we're, we would literally be starting all over again. So I think it's having the election 
December is probably at least for the keeping the board intact and having it move forward. I think it will be important to have it in place. I think there's a prohibition yep. against it. So. Okay, as long as you're good, you're your counsel to the board. And I, okay, I, 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 yeah, I'm not sure that there's really a particular rule. I mean, even the Roberts rules were our guidelines for us, so we can pretty much do what we want to do, I think. Yeah, on that, you typically can. I mean, in boards, and you guys have served on boards in the past, what's been done, but it's usually better to have that, those moving forward because then you got two you got new people moving in the first month they don't know anybody mm -hmm. uh, as well which is hard to do so and are the uh, governor's appointees will be four years mm -hmm. is that what it is yeah. i think yes. i recall yes so they're around a long time to people in yeah and joe and i started in both of us i think in january of 2020 so must have been 2020. Thumbs right. On the initial board. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. But you guys stay on, right? Both of you. I don't know, Joe. Do board? you know? I know nobody disappears until the next group is appointed. I did find that out. So that, you don't just stop. That's right. But my my officially un... ends at the end of the year. This calendar year. Yeah. Yeah, they do, but the way the statute's written, you stay on board. It's a lifetime you, sentence, you Joe. Deserve, you don't get to go away it's right irrelevant. away. But the question is, so you guys need to be reappointed to stay, right? What you're saying? I think so. I think, yeah, we're both governor appointed. You're governor appointee also, Joe? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you yep. can do another four years. Well, there's no term limit, is there? No, you guys no, could no, be no. on for 16 to 20 Like years. I said, a lifetime, life sentence. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to stay on if if it's an option. Okay. You guys could be chair and vice chair. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <Not get carried away. laughs> You're in a few hats at that point, won't you, Tracy? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, unless there's an objection, I think we're gonna try to do a vote December 20. <laughs> and we'll have the point. annual report reviewed and mm -hmm. Right. ready to go so then we also need to solicit nominations then too like you did last time yeah. okay we'll do it the same way we did last time okay so you business? know my wife said no what's that my wife said no i can't do this well, no just out of share that well you got a month to get her talked yeah. into no. it <laughs> yeah i've been saying as vice chair or any chair staying on the committee so, oh anyway well, your wife, she'll say that we're nice people. Yeah. Say, let's have the meeting at his house. Yeah. We can do that. We can do that. Anyway. Okay. Do we have any other business we'd like to discuss? Joe. 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 Sorry. Real quick, Rocco. What what time is the meeting on the twentieth? Is it the same time? It's scheduled for the regular nine to twelve. Okay. okay. Uh, online <laughs> and as much as I would like to have it be in person my guess is that five days before Christmas folks are going to be preoccupied with other things and so I'm anticipating it's a virtual meeting okay. we're, not, we're not having um, one more meeting right that will be the beginning of December uh, beginning yes okay so we'll you be always do hybrid too for those who can make it yeah I mean, hybrid works sure. and that's certainly an option we could consider. Thanks, Keith. Well, if there is no additional business, I think we're going to move to adjourn. Okay. Again, I'll offer the invitation if you would like to go over and see sure. Ann Mac and sure. Lisa connect here with Pokey, and I'm sure she will take me on a three hour journey. <laughs> no, I'm going to talk to Robert and Craig so that oh, he's going to say anything. Thank you. I'm a person. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Just the same. Yeah. She too. It's, it's a little, a little. It's a total surprise. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep you informed. Oh, yeah. Like I said, when I looked at the link, I'm like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. It's just like, I, I, now means I got to give us, I give remarks. I added, well, I added commentaries for at least two of those. The other side. So, I, I, Randy Woodson gave me, what Randy gave me.